Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Can everybody hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Oh, okay. Now I can hear you. It's my volume. That's what it is. I'm trying it out. All right. So, uh, alhamdulillah, I feel like this um, gathering has a lot of barakah. Alhamdulillah, somehow Allah is allowing us to really um, get through a lot of useful, beneficial reminders. Alhamdulillah. So today, I hope everyone is doing well. Has anyone done anything interesting recently that you'd like to share? Everyone doing boring stuff at home? Corona time. <laughs> Corona time. Okay. The community pool opened? Oh, the community pool opened? Did you get to go visit? Uh, I don't have a pass yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I did a couple of things. Well, um, I got back on the swim team, which felt really good. And the oh. uh, coaches made us, like, die yesterday. Oh. And uh, I'm rereading the Harry Potter series. Oh, that sounds like fun. That's yeah. awesome. I'll bet it feels really good getting back into the swimming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially with the weather and, like, honestly, yeah, it feels it's good to move a little bit, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. That's great. So welcome everybody. So today, inshallah, we're going to touch base with um, one of the chapters that we have. And that chapter is about seeking knowledge, seeking knowledge. So as we know, uh, seeking knowledge is something very important in the life of a Muslim. Oh, knowledge, uh, I know everyone here is, mashallah, taking some steps uh, to do that. But it's always good to be, you know, uh, reminded of how important that is and the role that it has in our life. And if you are following along in the book, we have uh, a chapter about that on page 212, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or where we are reminded that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will elevate the person who tries to seek knowledge, okay? And so the Prophet wasallam said, whoever takes a path seeking knowledge, Allah will ease his path to paradise. Whoever seeks a path seeking knowledge, Allah will ease his path to paradise. That is a tremendous, tremendous, uh, beautiful teaching because um, why would Allah ease his path to paradise? It is not easy to seek knowledge. You have to have sincerity. You have to make effort, right? You have to take steps you have to believe in what you're doing, that this is important. And you have to uh, use, you know, like mental energy. You have to use physical energy. You have to make sacrifices. You have to give up things. And if you are doing these very noble steps, then what is the reward for that? Allah will make the path to paradise easy for you. Okay. So that is very uh, important for us to remember. Also on the next page, we learn on page 214 that the prophet said that Seeking knowledge is obligatory on every Muslim. The Prophet said, seeking knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim, male or female. In fact, uh, it's important to know there's some kinds of knowledge which are fard, okay, fard ayn on each individual. And there's also some kinds which are like a fard kifaya. These are all kahoot questions. So, Fard kifaya means, um, so fard ayn is when something is obligatory in every single person individually. So for example, Asma has to learn it, I have to learn it, my son Ahmed has to learn it. There's no exceptions. It's not enough for me to know something if Asma doesn't learn it herself, right? So that's like a fard ayn, obligatory kind of personal responsibility. There's also some kinds of knowledge which the whole community uh, is responsible that that some people in the community learn that knowledge. And as long as some people take care of that, then everyone's okay. But if some people in the community don't take care of learning these certain kinds of knowledge, then everybody is going to be a sinner, okay? So for example, um, we need some people in the field of medicine, environmental science, social work, Islamic science. So these are straight out of uh, page 214. These are some examples. If we don't have some people who know these things, right? If we don't have some firefighters, some policemen, some lawyers, some doctors, right? If we don't have some people in the community doing these tasks, then the whole community is going to suffer, right? We don't have to have everybody doing that. But it's really important that we think about the diverse needs of the community and that we take care of those by everybody pursuing uh, something which they are interested and talented in so that we fill the needs of the community. 
and the seeker of knowledge should intend to serve humanity in general with their knowledge, okay? And so um, this is uh, some of the information out of this book. I also wanted to go over specifically uh, some other information. Um, and there is uh, something which is perfect for this actually, and that is talking about seeking the knowledge of the Quran. Um, and I actually, in, in a book that I wrote a couple of years ago about the Quran, uh, I, what I did is I actually have a whole section which is just about way to the Quran. Uh, there's a lot of books that are kind of like um, paraphrased into this book. And one of them is a very good book, um, Way to the Quran by Khuram Murad. He has really good message here about how to go about seeking knowledge and studying the Quran. So what I was doing in here is just kind of like taking that down to a youth level so that we can, uh, you know, kind of skip to the things that maybe uh, the youth understand. So when we consider our very important book, the Quran, you know, how do we, uh, how should we relate with the Quran? Uh, well, all of this advice that's in Way to the Quran, this is advice from Quran Murad. He has like a strategy, which I'm basically you know, going to share with you. And his strategy, even though he organizes it a certain way, his evidence is from the Quran and Sunnah. So, you know, the things I'm telling you are like, um, you know, I might have a list of like five or six or seven things he says, but then he brings like Quran and Sunnah to support his way. So, for example, one thing that he says in his chapter two is the seven states of the heart and mind. So in spirituality, one concept that we've been embracing is that your heart has a certain state, right? Your heart, is it pure? Is it filthy? Is it strong? Is it weak? You know, what kind of a state of heart do you have? And, and we are trying to become more and more aware of our state of our heart and our state of our mind, right? And so um, the more you're aware of your spirituality, the more aware you are of the state of your mind, your heart, um, you know, your, your, inner, your uh, inner condition, and you have more control. So here, what Huram Murad is saying is, number one, you have to have faith that the Quran is the word of God. So if you're going about the Quran, trying to study the Quran, you really have to have faith that it is the word of God. It's going to be different if you doubt that. If you just pick it up with like half-hearted intention, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to get that full guidance and benefit. Number two, purity of intention and purpose. We're going to go into that uh, in more detail, but you have to have a purity of intention and purpose. And you, if you have the wrong intention or the wrong purpose, there's many examples of how you might have the wrong intention and wrong purpose. We're going to go into that. Bringing gratitude and praise. So we're going, to, you know, when we go into studying the Quran, we have to bring gratitude and praise to Allah. Number four, he says, acceptance and trust. You accept the message of Allah, and you trust that this is the right message. Also, number five, obedience and change. What he says is when we're reading the Quran, we need to obey what message is in there, and we need to be willing and ready to change uh, what we have within ourselves. Number six, he mentions hazards and obstacles uh, when we go about um, uh, studying the Quran. And also number seven, he talks about trust and dependence. So let's go a little bit more into uh, the prerequisites. So he was saying um, about the first prerequisite, he says, come to the Quran with a strong and deep faith that is, this is the word of Allah and that, uh, and that Allah is your creator and Lord, okay? So Quran Murad is reminding us that we need to come with a full belief that this is the word of Allah, okay? So for example, in Surah Anfal, Surah 8, verse 2, Allah says, believers are only those who, whenever Allah is mentioned, their hearts tremble with awe. And whenever his revelations are recited to them, they increase them in faith. Okay, so this is like an evidence of what he's telling us is that, you know how we're talking about that spiritual heart? And it's not the same thing as the heart that, you know, when you go to the doctor and they get like a stethoscope and they check your heart, that's also your heart. That's your, that's your physical heart. But your spiritual heart is the one that, trembles when Allah is mentioned, you know, your heart, your spiritual heart trembles, okay? And also, when you, um, when you recite these verses, it, it should increase your faith. So this is uh, part of number one. And number two, we said, is that um, the purpose and intention has to be pure, that you're getting guidance from your Lord, okay? Because what Allah says in Surah 2, verse 26, is thereby he causes many to go astray, and thereby he guides many, 
but thereby he causes none to go astray except the iniquitous. So if you don't have the right sincerity and intention and purpose, you can actually go astray or you might not um, get the guidance. And how are, what are some examples of that? Let's look at what he says. So for example, don't read it only for intellectual pursuit. That would be an example where you're not sincere and you're not reading it for the right reasons. There are people in this world who read the Quran for intellectual reasons. And there are many people who do that. So if you go to these Orientalists or if you go to these universities, uh, my sister studies uh, Islamic studies at Princeton, and there are many non-Muslims that focus on the Quran. Their entire degree is in Islamic studies. They know everything about the Quran, about the Sira, about the history of Islam, but they're not Muslims. They're reading the Quran for intellectual reasons. There's also Muslims uh, who read it for the same reason. They might be studying the Quran, but they're not practicing it. So if you're doing it just for intellectual pursuit, that's not the same thing. And that, that is one of the wrong intentions. Number two, it says, do not come to the Quran with a fixed intention to find support for your own views, notions, and doctrines. Whoever interprets the Quran by this personal opinion shall take his place in the fire. So if you have some intention, if somebody is just trying to prove something bad about Islam, and then they're like digging in the Quran just to find like, oh, you know, this bad thing, well, here's all the evidence, you know, that this terrible, this is something bad about Allah, you know, about the Prophet, about Islam, that is another mistake, uh, that is another, um, you know, insincerity. Also, uh, number three, nothing could be more unfortunate than to use the Quran to secure for your own worldly things such as esteem, status, or money. So if you're just literally doing this for money, where you are learning the Quran just for money, and you don't have any sincerity in there, then that could be an insincerity. And it says, um, for example, Al-Bayhaqi says, indeed the Prophet, blessings and peace on him said, if anyone studies the Quran, uh, seeking thereby a living from his people, he will rise on the day of resurrection with his face as a fleshless bone. He also said that one who learns, recites, and teaches the Quran for worldly acclaim will be thrown into the fire. And that is a hadith from Muslim. Number four, the ultimate end of the world of Quran should not just be a healing of bodily affliction, psychological peace, and deliverance from poverty. Okay, what does that mean? We know that sometimes the Quran can be, you know, like a ruqya and this, and it can be, um, you know, uh, sometimes we do think, you've heard of like meditation and 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 some of the you know, um, sometimes there's like a harmonious uh, peacefulness that might come. If that's a secondary benefit on top of your sincerity, then that is great. That's actually a benefit of the Quran. But if you are just reading it, like in some of the countries, I can tell you in the country that I'm originally from, there are people who think that, okay, if you get sick, they have nothing to do with the Quran normally, okay? When they, somebody gets sick, oh, come recite the Quran as if it's like some hocus pocus magic or something. Yes, if you have the full belief and you're doing it as like a real, you know, you're already believing in the Quran, you're already, and then and then you do the ruqya and you do things like that, that is with belief. But if you're doing it like you hire somebody to come do like hocus pocus or something, or put like, you know, the tabis or whatever, some of these things, those are wrong. You know, you don't just do it as like a, as, as like a, a secondary thing. Also, um, he says, you know, um, also not to go to another source for guidance. So it, one of the one of the examples of the mistakes is if you, uh, you know, we're supposed to go to the Quran as our only source that, you know, that is the that is the main source of guidance. If you are going to other sources of guidance alongside with it, then that is another form of mistake that Khura Murad is saying. So, for example, if you say, well, I believe in the, you know, Hindu book and the Quran and the and the this and that. Well, I mean, they're not equal. You know, you have to believe. In the Quran. So he also says uh, the third prerequisite that we mentioned is that Khura Murad says, make yourself constantly alert with intense praise and gratitude to your Lord for having blessed you with his greatest gift of the Quran and have your and uh, for having guided you to its uh, reading and study. The fourth prerequisite to accept and trust without doubt or hesitation every knowledge and guidance that the Quran conveys to you. What are some verses of the Quran that, that validates that? The Surah Al-Isra, verse 105, it says, with the truth we have sent it down and with the truth it has come down. Also in Surah An'am, Allah says on verse 115, and perfect are the words of your Lord in truth and justice. Okay? Also the fifth 
uh, prerequisite is to bring the willpower and the resolve and readiness to obey whatever the Quran says, change your life, um, your attitude and your behavior inwardly and outwardly as desired by it. So we need to have like this fervor that we want to do whatever the Quran tells us to do and that you know we, we are ready to obey whatever is in the Quran, okay? The sixth prerequisite is to remain aware that you embark upon reading the Quran, that when you embark upon reading the Quran, shaitan will create every possible hazard and obstacle to, uh, you know, to, to get in the way of you, of getting the riches of the Quran. So what is our evidence of that? In Surah Al-A'raf, verse 16 to 17, it says, I shall surely sit in ambush for them all along thy straight path. I shall then come on them from between their hands, from behind them, from their right and their left. Thou will not find most of them thankful. So the shaitan is waiting in ambush to create doubt, to create problems, to make us have obstacles, laziness, tiredness, uh, to um, you know blur our belief, to make us disbelieve, to make us question what's in the Quran. But we really need to take that individual ownership. Each girl here has to take that individual ownership of loving and learning the Quran. And we should know that the shaitan is waiting to make a problem for us, right? And so that is a, something that uh, we learn about in the Quran. Uh, also, he talks about the participation of the inner self. So Hura Murad in lesson three of his book, so this is his book, Way to the Quran, and this, you know, I've just summarized it in this book, um, for, for the youth, which is the participation of the inner self. So when we're reading the Quran, it is very good and obligatory and beautiful to read the Arabic, you know, with, that's the original language. But also we learn the meaning and we participate with our spiritual side. The spiritual side of us participates, how? So th there are many Quranic evidences that Allah is telling us to participate with our spiritual side. So in Surah Zumar, Verse 23, it says, it's the hearts which soften, because we talked about soft heart yesterday, right? Um, or harden and become stony. And that's from Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 74. Okay, also Surah Hajj, verse uh, 46. It is they which go blind and refuse to recognize the truth. Is Allah talking about physical blindness or spiritual blindness? Spiritual blindness, right? That means that uh, when someone does not want to see the truth of Islam, it says, in three different surahs, Surah Araf, Hajj, and Qaf, it says, for it is their function to reason and understand. So we should participate with reasoning and understanding. Okay, also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 52, in our hearts lie the roots of all outward diseases. In our hearts, our spiritual hearts lie the roots of outward diseases, right? So we understand that. Now that we're studying about the diseases of the hearts and how it's like really starts here in the heart, that grows and it goes into our actions, which is outside diseases. So there's so many more verses that support uh, this concept, but due to time, I'm not gonna go um, into all of those verses. But basically, when, whenever we are uh, studying the Quran and we're seeking knowledge, we're studying Quran, we have to participate in every way, okay? And uh, Khura Murad gives four steps for the dynamic inner participation. So he says, First, you come to know the truth. Second, you recognize and accept it as the truth. Third, you remember the truth as much as you can. And fourth, you absorb it and let it soak into the deepest, uh, uh, deepest of your inner self. And then, you know, and then that's how you absorb the truth. And let's go into some others. So we talked about Surah Al-Fatiha before and how Allah SWT answers back on those verses. Uh, it's very nice because uh, there's a hadith here that actually says the things that Allah answers you with. So um, in uh, Muslim and Thirmidhi and Ahmed, this is one hadith that says, I have divided the prayer between me and my servant. Half is for me and half is for him. So Allah is saying that he divided that prayer. It says, for when the servant says, all praise belongs to the Lord of the world, that means Alhamdulillah Rabbil What does Allah say? My servant has praised me. When the servant says, the most merciful, the mercy giving, Allah says, my servant has extolled me. When the servant says, Master of the Day of Judgment, Allah says, my servant has glorified me. This is my portion. When he says, thee alone we worship and thee alone we seek help, he says, this is shared by me and my servant. He will be given what he asks for. And when he says, guide us on the straight path, he says, 
this belongs to my servant and my servant shall have what he asked for. So those are the actual answers to what Allah says on each of those verses in uh, Surah Al-Fatiha. Uh, and also Quran Murad talks about the acts of the heart and the body. The acts of the heart and the body when we are uh, you know, reading the Quran. So uh, he talks about seven acts. Number one, the response of your spiritual heart. Number two, the response of your tongue. Number three, tears, tears in your eyes. Number four, postures of your body. Number five, reading with tartil, tartil. Number six, self-purification. And number seven, seeking Allah's help and dua. Okay? And so um, he talks about on uh, lesson four. So in chapter four of his book, lesson four, Quran Murad talks about the rules of reading the Quran. And this goes into like how often we should read. There's a hadith in which, uh, which says, it's from Bukhari and Muslim, that Allah likes things which are done regularly, even if little, uh, said the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. So one thing about the Quran, I know that we really focus on it a lot, like in the month of Ramadan, we pick it up, we really try our best to like complete reading it and going over the meaning. And then life gets really busy and sometimes it's only like in Quran class or like Sunday school or whatever, you know, like, or you know, when you have your Quran teacher come sometimes, but what we really need to do is start like, making a plan for ourselves to really read the Quran regularly. The Quran is a book that needs to be read regularly. It's not something that we just like pick it up absolutely when we have to, like, you know, like on, you know, Ramadan or like on the weekends or, you know, every person has to try to read the Quran regularly, even if it's very, very little, even if it's little. And so um, it is, as, as we learn from this hadith, it is better to do something regularly and consistently. That's something that Allah loves. And uh, there's another hadith here. It says the parable of the companion of the Quran is like the tethered camel. A man holds on to it as long as he attends to it and it escapes. It escapes if he lets it loose. So if you have a camel and you have like this tether, right? Um, as long as you hold on to that tether and you know you, you keep in track of it, that camel is going to stay near you. But when you let go of that tether, the camel is going to walk away. You're going to lose it. And it's very much like the Quran. And it's very uh, true, you know, from life experience, I can say that the more you make that intention and get involved with learning the this very holy, special book of Allah that's made just for you, the more you feel close to doing that and you make it regular and, and you get into it the, and, and you're doing this consistently, then it's you're going to be close to the Quran. You're going to feel close to Allah. But the more you get far away from it, 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 it's just going to get away from you. So it's really important that we consciously try to uh, read the Quran regularly, even if it's a little bit. Um, so he gives some examples in his book. Some people try to read the Quran like the whole thing um, in every two months, every one month, every 10 days, one week. The, the focus is not reading the whole Quran. The focus is taking a little bit and really understanding the meaning of that. So what are some uh, times that we can maybe put that into our day? Uh, what are some what are some ways we can make sure that we really get to that? One option is right when you wake up in the morning, when you pray Fajr, you can set aside five or ten minutes to just try to read like a few lines of Quran and try to just read the meaning of that. And that is probably the best time to get it done in the whole day. Another option is if you're in the car and you're going somewhere, and I know most of you girls don't have to drive yet, so that's a perfect time. And you could even keep a copy of it like in a respectful place in the, in the car. That way you always have like a copy of your Quran. You can also listen to something, you know, um, with the Quran. You can listen to a series like when you're driving. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to always listen to that only, but like you can make a point that, okay, when I'm driving, I'm always going to follow like this little, um, you know, tafsir series or something so I can slowly get through it. Like if I can't make the time to read it on my own, I can listen to something like in the car. Another time would be like after Maghrib, just sit down or before you go to sleep and you're washed up and you're going to go to sleep just every night, like pick it up, you know, and try to just do a little bit like every single day. And nowadays with technology, it's, um, it, it's so much easier than it used to be before. And so he does uh, remind us about, you know, having respectful posture. It's at least worth mentioning that, you know, when you're reading the Quran, for example, uh, it's not like a regular novel where you're just like laying in bed and you have to be respectful. You need to sit up properly, you know, always be in a, in a respectful posture when you're reading the Quran. Also, you have to read it correctly. So we all have to make that effort 
to uh, learn to read it correctly. And we know the jui is important. That's like the rules of, of recitation, right? So here are uh, some different uh, hadith about that. For example, one who is skilled in reading the Quran is with the noble virtuous angels who bring down the revelation who, and one who falters while reading it and finds it hard to read correctly will have double the reward for reading and for exerting. That's from Bukhari and Muslim. So, so if you read the Quran beautifully, your, your, your uh, status is like the virtuous angels. And if you find that it takes a lot of effort uh, to read it correctly, you know, there's people who um, really, you know, uh, Arabic is not their first language or, you know, they have to make a lot, maybe they uh, came to Islam later and, and this is like very difficult for them to learn Arabic and, uh, you know, read the Quran uh, correctly, you're get, gonna get that much more reward. It says double the reward for all that exertion. Also, let's say you're just starting out like reading Quran, you know, you decide right now in your life, you're in middle school, you're ready, you're growing up, you wanna start reading the Quran. At the beginning, it's gonna be harder, you know, like slowly you're gonna read it, it's gonna get easier for you. At the beginning, it is hard to like learn Arabic and, and, and uh, recite it, but what Allah is saying is the beauty is you're gonna get more reward when you make that extra effort about reciting beautifully. Um, there are many hadith, like Abu Dawood that says beautifully, the, uh, recite the Quran beautifully. Uh, you know, um, also from Bukhari, it says, God does not listen to anything as he does to a prof, as he does to a prophet with a good voice who recites the, who recites the Quran. Also, uh, listening attentively to the Quran. So if someone else is reciting the Quran, listen attentively. Surah Al-A'raf, verse 204, uh, Allah says, when the Quran is read, listen attentively and fall silent so you may be blessed with mercy. So some manners that sometimes when you're in a Muslim country or, you know, there, there's some things that seem to be more common, but in this country, sometimes because we're not in that full environment, like sometimes there's things we take for granted. So if somebody, let's say there's Quran being recited in the house, right? Um, you know, be respectful. And, and, you know, somebody's reciting Quran in that room. Don't just go and and like, turn on something else at that time. You know, don't just turn on TV, music, YouTube. Okay, if you're reciting Quran, you know, be respectful. And by the way, if it's prayer time, some of those prayer times are time sensitive. They don't have the range. It's a prayer time. Remember that you should drop everything and go pray at that time. Those time sensitive prayers like Fajr and Maghrib, um, it's not okay to just like keep on like watching things, playing cards, doing something else. If it's a time sensitive prayer, the way to respect Allah and to respect the prayer, you just literally drop what you're doing and you go pray. And if there's people who are praying, you know, um, similarly, we're, we're being taught to listen attentively. If there's like people already praying, you have to like be quiet at that time as well. Do not just go on about your business making noise when people in the house are trying to pray, okay? So I hope that we remember like if it's Maghrib time, you know, don't delay, just drop what you're doing. Those cards are still gonna be there. You know, your YouTube is still gonna be there. Everything's still gonna be there. Your food, whatever. I mean, food, there's a little bit of a teaching. Like if you're in the middle of eating or something, you don't leave it. But I mean, in general, like most of the activities that we do, once it's time for like a time sensitive prayer, you drop everything and then you go. Uh, you know, in our house, we used to like turn off anything, like turn off any other device. Like it's disrespectful, you know, to, to do that during uh, the prayer time. But we should know that if you listen to even one verse of the Quran, you will get also reward. And that is from a hadith as well. It says, whoever listens, even one verse of the Quran will be given double the reward. So, um, you know, I'm going to stop there. There's some more that he has to say. You can get uh, this book, Way to the Quran, uh, Quran Murad. It's, it's a really good one for like, uh, for just a, a way to go about um, approaching the Quran. Uh, and that's mainly the points that we got out today. I'm going to jump over to the Kahoot game, inshallah. So let's keep all of those things in mind. So if you'd like to open your Kahoot, inshallah, we have covered all of those questions. So let me open the Kahoot really quick, inshallah. Bismillah. And I'm going to share my screen. All right. Yeah, you want to be my assistant? Go ahead. But give them enough time to uh, do the question, okay? I'll just wait till I finish this one. Okay. Can everybody see? It says 176786. 176786. That is the game pick. 
So we have some players joining in. Do you want to be the assistant or do you want to play? I'll be assistant. Okay, come on, come sit down. I was going to help out. Well, let's give them a chance to get on. One, seven, six, seven, two, eight, six. Only Wait, one. give me a few more seconds. Give me a soup a few more seconds. Sure. Me too. I'm pretty sure that we went over everything in here. All right. Okay, I'm gonna count to ten. After that, seven, six, seven. Wait, Esma, can you say the the pin? One seven six seven two eight six. One seven six seven two eight six. Can you say it one more time? One seven six seven two eight six. So it should be on the screen, right, guys? All right, let's start. One seven six seven two eight six. Very good. Okay, let's start. Okay, I'm gonna start now. Five seconds. One, two, three, four. <coughs> Number one. Which type of deed is obligatory only on some in the community? But if nobody does it, everybody sins. Farain, Farkefaya, Makru, or Haram? Which type of deed is obligatory only some in the community? The correct answer is Farkefaya. So that is the kind of fard where it's obligatory on some in the community. Wait, did only one person get it? Number two, true or false, there are some type of knowledge which are obligatory for each individual to learn, called Farda'in. There are some types of knowledge which are obligatory for each individual to learn. Very good. So there's some things that every single person needs to learn. Very, very good. Next question. Whoever seeks a path seeking knowledge, Allah will ease a path to what? The library, faster internet, paradise, or hellfire? We said the prophet said this hadith. Faster internet. The answer is paradise. Very good. So whoever seeks a path to seeking knowledge, Allah will ease a path to paradise. Excellent. Good job, girls. Number four, learning the rules of how to pray is an example of what? Group optional knowledge, individual obligatory knowledge, group paid knowledge, or individual optional knowledge. Learning the rules of how to pray. Very, very good. That's individual obligatory knowledge. Very, very good. Good job, girls. Next. Number five, true or false? As Muslims, we should also try to ponder on the meaning of the Quran and practice it. Is that true or false? True or false? Okay, very good. Exactly. The next question. Great, mashallah. Number six, true or false? It is enough to read the Quran once in your lifetime. It's enough to read the Quran once in your lifetime. Is that true or false? No. We have to keep trying to read it regularly for as long as we can in our lifetime, inshallah. Very, very good. Let's see the next question. Number seven. When we read the Quran, we should what? Feel the message is for us personally. Only take the parts we like. Not worry about learning Arabic or none of the above. When we read the Quran, very good. We have to feel that the message is for us personally. Very, very good. I think everybody did amazing. In third place, Maliha. Second place, Aisha. First place, Noor. We also have Asya and Aisha. I do want to say that everybody is a winner. Press next. Next is too loud. Okay. Okay, yeah. so I do want to say that everybody's a winner just for being here today. Uh, the fact that you are giving so much time uh, and your intention, you are seeking knowledge, and inshallah, Allah will ease a path to paradise for everybody here. Mashallah, you guys are doing a great job by participating. Today is uh, Thursday, so we do not have class on uh, Friday or Saturday, but we'll be back together, inshallah, next week on Sunday, same time, same place, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khairan, may Allah accept from all of you. Have a great weekend. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah tubu ilayhi wal asr inna al insana la fi khusr.
إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم